Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Lisa Hirshhorn, and I'm absolutely delighted to be able to speak to you briefly uh, today, looking at uh, the strategies for scale. Now, similar to, um, to many of the uh, talks that we're giving, there's often a lot of uh, really good synergy between what I'm gonna be talking about and what other uh, presenters will be talking about as well. Now, you might notice that some of our uh, terminology may be different, but um, hopefully we'll be able to answer any questions when we actually have the ability to uh, link together synchronously online or actually meet together in person. So the overview of this lecture is we're gonna talk very briefly about understanding strategy selection during scale-up and specific to scale-up, using strategies to link context using mechanisms to outcomes. These 10 domains that have been identified in the literature for scale-up, particularly also for sustaining uh, at scale, how we might think about applying standardized terminology and why, how we might think about choosing and defining strategies for scale-up, adapting strategies from pilot to and during scale-up, and reporting on some of these scale-up strategies. There will also be opportunities for you to pause and think about some of the questions, as well as read in more detail some of the slides. So just to remind you, implementation strategies are what we do to help people or places or organizations do the thing we are scaling up, whether it's a vaccine, whether it's hypertension treatment, whether it's interventions to reduce maternal mortality. At scale versus a pilot, strategies may need to be introduced, be expanded, or be adapted. Specific implementation strategies also may need to be at multiple levels, may be broader than the ones we think about in health systems, such as policy. They may be at the system level. And again, determining where and how adaptation is needed. So when we think about, for example, a pilot that worked in a highly um, specialized setting, will that actually work when you go to a broader setting? Now, if we think about the areas of scale-up strategies for an evidence-based intervention or program across a continuum, again, there's this sort of idea you have a new idea or a model approach. For example, I worked on scaling up the safe, better the better birth checklist or the safe, safe childbirth checklist. It was piloted in a restricted area, and I'll use this as an example throughout, which was in a hospital with a very, very engaged and brilliant champion and leader. These strategies are tested, the outcomes are measured, we then use monitoring and evaluation and learning and knowledge management that gives us internal knowledge, what kind of adaptations, what strategies, as well as outside knowledge of people who say, yeah, we think this is a good idea. That should lead to scale up and then ultimately to broader impact. And if we think about it, you have the innovation, you have the learning, and then you have the scale up. Now, a couple of things that are very important to remember for your strategies is learning from your pilot. So what were the strategies you chose and what barriers did they address? What was the support from the research team? It's a very interesting example with the um, safe surgical checklist, which worked incredibly well in the initial study, but then when it was actually implemented in Ontario, it didn't. And that's because coaching was actually provided from the research team. Practice facilitation is another strategy. It's often not recognized during the pilot. How successful were those strategies? Were adaptations needed even during the pilot? And in your scale-up settings, what contextual factors may be different, which may need new strategies? For example, in Peru, when they did maternal waiting homes, they were very successful. But when they went to a very different, an area with very different culture, they had to adapt them because they weren't going to be successful. Women needed to be able to bring in their families. Even the energy that they used to cook, coal versus firewood, had to be adapted. So when we think about it, this sort of tension between fidelity and adaptation is really this discussion that you need to see and again, see lecture 4C for that, but how tailored are your intervention strategies and what context you're expanding to? And again, what strategies were part of the research and need to be transferred? So I want you just to put yourself on, on pause for a second and reflect. What strategies are you using or planning to use in your pilot? Do you know what factors they address and what mechanisms? And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that, but also there are a number of other lectures that will help you with that. <laughs> 
So when we think about this, sort of when we start to approach the scale and the strategies and the framework, again, it depends on your scale up goals. And you've already had some lectures on this, a vertical versus horizontal, targeted scale up in an area versus nationally, a focus on initial results versus sustainability. In an emergency setting, for example, you might wanna just quickly get things out and you'll worry about sustainability later. But in other places where you really need this intervention to stay, you need to start to think about sustainability from the start. There's been a number of identified scale domains that can inform the broader strategies that are needed, included not just at the micro level, getting the healthcare provider or the individual to do something, but really at the policy and national macro level and meso levels. And there's a number of frameworks that exist. I'm gonna focus on two, but there are indeed two other ones that you could look at. Now, when you think about your over in, overarching intervention and scale, again, these goals will inform your strategy selection and design. And here's some examples of, of scale up or scale out, quantitative, you know, I wanna go from a few to many, I want to actually make things more functional, longer, I want to think about political scale, et cetera. So the WHO expand net defines scaling up, vertical scaling up as institutionalization through policy, political, legal, budgetary, or other health system changes that expand the scope to larger, to higher areas. So it's really scaling up what's needed to support it. Now, other people define vertical scaling up, as you know, is that it's actually expanding at the, 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 the scope of what the service is. So for example, going from basic hypertension care in the primary health care, all the way up to what's happening at tertiary care hospitals. Horizontal scaling up is probably more, more commonly known, expansion or replication, but there can also be diversification or this interesting concept of spontaneous scaling up, where something is so successful and so interested that it starts to scale up even before um, you've actually begun to think about that. So here's an example. So for example, for primary hypertension care, you might consider scaling up vertically, you might consider the context. So are there no policy and guidelines? Are there new service areas or delivery points? So the strategy might be individual and systems capacity building, advocacy and stakeholder engagement. On the other hand, if you're considering horizontally, so for example, work that DKOG and Mark Huffman that you've heard about who've been leading in terms of um, expanding primary healthcare delivered for hypertension, you might wanna think about new PHC sites and populations. Again, stakeholder engagement, you hear that a lot, but also some formative work to identify new barriers as you're going to different states or different districts. Now, when we think about this again, there's a number of, of literatures that have been put out there. And we did a literature review that identified some key strategies, 10 strategy domains relevant to scale up and sustainability. And these include things like fiscal support, political support, community in involvement, integration, buy-in and the depth of what happens there, partnerships, balancing flexibility and standardization, Again, we don't want people messing around with HIV treatment, but the strategies and who's actually delivering it might differ. The supportive policy, regulatory, and legal environments, building and sustaining strong organizational capacity, so who's delivering it, transferring ownership, very hard, very important, decentralization, something that's been happening in health systems, and again, this ongoing focus of sustainability. Now, many of these may have been used during the pilot, but again, they may need to be broader, higher level approaches or strategies for at scale implementation and adaptation. And the next two slides have full details, so please pause to read on your own time. Now I'm gonna sort of very briefly go over um, the IHI framework. And this is one that's actually been used very successfully both for under five mortality as well as HIV and other ideas. And the idea is that there's really sort of four steps in scale up. Um, and this is the overall approach for a broader scale up strategy. So the first is what they call the setup. And that's sort of preparing the ground, the stakeholder engagement for the introduction and testing of the intervention that will be taken to full scale. And so these are some of the strategies that you might do for formative work, or for pilot work, but again, beginning to plan for scale. You then do what's considered to be a scalable unit, which is the early testing phase. And there you need strategies for development testing. And the scalable unit might be a community. It might be a health facility. It might be an entire district, for example, for reducing neonatal mortality. You then gonna, once you sort of say, okay, I know how to do this, then you wanna test the scale up. So to test the intervention now, just in this one, not in that one initial pilot, but a variety of settings that are likely to represent really all the variability, the different areas that you might be encountering at full scale, different uh, rural versus urban, for example, 
Perhaps there's some localized conflict that's happening, very different cultural settings, et cetera. And from there, then you ideally go to full scale, obviously trying to make this as rapid as possible to really get to the largest number of people. And again, you're gonna to need to adapt and expand your strategies, including those that are more specifically related, more generically to scale. Now, another approach by Hartman and Lynn is really focuses on whether and how to scale three building blocks, talking about the vision, the drivers, and then the space to grow. And the space to grow is really the target of your main strategies, the fiscal, economic, political, cultural, partnership, capacity, and learning. And again, these are, are, are really requiring some of these, what they call contextual factors, but if they're absent, they also need strategies, leadership and values, political constituencies, incentives and accountability, the use of data, DHIS2 has been very, very helpful for that, as well as thinking about how to make this orderly and gradual, ideally. I think COVID has taught us a lot about rapid scale. That's perhaps not so orderly and certainly not gradual, but often sometimes that is indeed what is needed. So you need to then understand the context. So do you have these things and the relevant and feasible strategies that you need to then design and test both from pilot and then going to scale? So the um, World Health Organization, along with ExpandNet, uh, have published this very um, nice uh, document called Beginning with the End in Mind. And it gives you essentially a roadmap of these 12 things that you need to actually do, many of which you will see are actually implementation strategies, such as engaging in a participatory process involving key stakeholders, reaching consensus on expectations for scale up, very, very important, tailoring the innovation, so adaptation, this is actually of the innovation, but you know, that's certainly uh, one of the things, but if it's just a vaccine, you probably don't want to tailor that, but you actually need to think about the strategies. And then the idea of testing it under um, a variety of settings, developing plans to document. So again, learning from the process of implementation as well as the number ones. And I would just refer to this as a very, very helpful um, white paper. And again, these are all strategies and some of them need strategies to actually get them to work. So if you think about mapping your strategies through your mechanisms, you know, if your determinant is provider knowledge deficit, then you might need to indeed do education, provision of information. You think that through awareness building, knowledge acquisition, motivation, that that will then make it more feasible, acceptable, appropriate and adoption. Another one might be, for example, staff turnover. Big, big problem in many places. And for that, your strategy might be a train the trainer. The mechanisms that you have on continuous onsite expertise available for consultation and will help with sustainability as well as fidelity as well. Um, another one might be, for example, that you're going there and it's chaos, unstandardized clinical care options. Early in HIV treatment, that was absolutely what helped. So the strategy might be guidelines, probably a bundled with training and, and, and potentially coaching and supportive supervision, but ultimately it gives clarity of clinical care as well as fidelity. And so that's why you really need to understand what are your contextual factors and then choose wisely why you're, what your implementation strategy needs to be. These are examples uh, to identify specific strategies to link context through mechanism. Again, we'll uh, leave you to walk through this in more detail, but just to take uh, one example, one of my sort of favorite things, monitoring and evaluation. So again, the, uh, the, the issue is that you need to identify key outcomes um, and strategies and identify what's actually happening there. This might be another one if there's resources that are needed, you might integrate it into existing macro level funding mechanisms or stakeholder engagement and cost data to plan for adequate budgetary allocation. So again, understand your gap, uh, do your strategy and recognize that monitoring evaluation, if it doesn't exist, you need a strategy to put that into place. If not, it becomes something that really helps you to get some of this other work done. So how can we apply standardized categories to scale up strategies and why should we actually bother? And again, this is, is an issue that it's very helpful when you say training, that people understand why you're doing training and what that is. And you can see there's a bunch of different groupings from Lehman of dissemination, integration, capacity building, and then the ERIC project, which is um, an expanded uh, approach to sort of grouping together um, strategies often can be very helpful. Now I'll say Eric was developed in um, a high income country, so often needs some tweaking to be able to do, but it is helpful to begin to understand why you're choosing from different, uh, different groupings. So I'm just sort of pausing for thought, which is actually one challenge that we see, not just in social science, but also now in implementation science of what we call homonymy, which is that the multiple meetings for the same term. So if I say stakeholder engagement or training or something like that, that it actually has different meanings depending on who's saying it and how I'm using it, 
versus simply synonymy, which is different terms with the same or overlapping meaning. And I'd love to be sort of for you to think about other examples of this that you've heard of in strategy and scale up, or that you've heard through some of the um, uh, some of the lectures you've heard. And if so, what do you think? How can the field overcome these problems? And looking forward to hearing any advice that you might have. Now, one of the things that we have found very, very helpful is this um, this approach that you know La Proctor um, came about. And it's, I think, a very, very important thing because it says to you, don't just say I'm going to train, don't just say I'm going to coach, but you really need to name it, you need to define it. So this is, again, this idea about using common terms, but then you need to specify it. Who is going to do the training? And, and sort of what, what does the training mean? Is it, is it didactic? Is it lecturing? Is it, is it simulation? Who is the target? What's the temporality? When is it going to be used? How much of it do you expect? One time, five times? the implementation outcome and the justification. And the reason this is so important, again, going back to Better Birth, is when we did this in the pilot, we were able to use this uh, champion and other people there as coaches. When we then went to scale it up in a different state, in a very different setting, so these were primary care centers with, um, with um, associate nurse, uh, nurse midwives, we actually found that physicians coaching them didn't work very well. The physicians actually yelled at them. And so we had to adapt this in terms of who was doing it and how they were doing it. We revised how we, how we did coaching, um, how it was being done and how often, and then thinking for sustainability, when would we start to um, remove it? it? Took us two years to do that. There's a paper that we wrote called uh, Learning Before Leaping that talks all about the strategy adaptation. So there's a number of your strategies that are likely need to be adapted and you need to track it because otherwise at the end, somebody says, well, why did you make that change? Everybody's like, I don't know. It seemed so clear at the time. It seemed like a good idea. So I'll just sort of refer you to something called Frame IS, uh, good guidance about, you know, in real time, what did you adapt? When did you adapt it? Why and who decided? And so do this either in real time or relative real time. So often what I do is I build it into my plan, monitoring and evaluation. So we have a pause and reflect, perhaps, for example, once a month to say what's been changed and why has it been changed. And that way also you don't get surprised when somebody decides to change something without actually talking to you. So I want you again to pause for thought. Are there any adaptations or updates needed for reporting strategies and adaptations that are used in scale-up studies? So how would you use this? Why do you think this would be important or why not? And let's again, we'll have to share that when we either um, are together uh, by Zoom or in person. So just four key messages that I'd like to leave you with that strategies need to be identified and evaluated from the pilot, what worked, what needs to be adapted, and based on the new context, sort of what needs to be similar, what's different, and what do you need to change. That strategies also need to be chosen based up on your goals and decisions based on the scope. Is this for everybody? Is it just in urban settings? The urgency, again, remember COVID, and the capacity among many things, and plan for this even when you're starting your pilot. Using some of the scale-up frameworks and the ones that, that really resonate with you can help inform where you need to measure the context and then choosing those strategies um, based on your mechanism. So what's the gap and how are you going to actually address it? What's your facilitator and how are you going to leverage it? And finally, including strategies to identify and plan for adaptation of your strategies and ongoing engagement is critical. So who needs to be engaged and how often it's not just at the beginning, but throughout to understand where the gaps, how do you understand them, and who needs to be engaged and agree to the adaptations you're planning. So this is just a very small selected reference list, and there's more that are available on the website. And I want to then thank you all for your time and your attention. And again, very much look forward to talking to you um, virtually and then at some point in person. Take care.